Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Bunker. I'm very excited because I get to welcome an expert onto the channel. As you all know, I like to explore the subject of religion and I like to explore the subject of cults. And I like to learn more about how cults operate, what they do to people and how we can recover from them. And to help me explore the latter of those subjects, I'm thrilled to welcome onto the channel, Dr. Alexandra Stein. Thank you, Lloyd. Thanks for inviting me. So just a bit of a more formal uh, introduction. You are a social psychologist, writer, and educator specializing in cults, totalitarianism, and extremism. And you have written two books, Terror, Love, and Brainwashing, Attachment in Cults and Totalitarian Systems, and Inside Out, a memoir of entering a breaking, entering a breaking out of a Minneapolis political cult. Fascinating. So you're the person to speak to on the subject of cult recovery, it seems. Well, one of the people, one of the people. One of the people. I, I love your modesty. Well, it's important, actually, because it's... Um, part of not being in a cult is that there are many voices and many people have good contributions, not, not just one person. So. Absolutely. Wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I thought it might be helpful uh, just to learn a little bit more about you before we kind of get underway. Uh, I'm sure viewers are fascinated to know how you came to be uh, interested in cults to the extent of dedicating your career to understanding them? Yes, well, one kind of comes to it often by accident, as I did. Um, I certainly didn't intend to start out with this uh, career. But, um, you know, it's a long story, which I wrote about in my first book, which you mentioned second, which is okay, the Inside Out book. But when I was 26... Um, I had been a leftist political activist prior to that. My family were had uh, were leftists and had uh, various kind of uh, activities, including fighting against apartheid in South Africa and other things and big trade unions. My grandpa was a trade unionist, and so it was sort of in my blood. And I grew up. Being and wanted to be an activist and was for quite some time in San Francisco. And then I ran by accident, which is often how people get into cults. I ran into some very nice people who are still nice, um, <laughs> who were doing some union organizing. And again, it's a rather long story, but through that connection, I got involved in this political cult, which people often don't think of political cults, they always think of religious cults, but cults can be any kind of belief system. And I wound up moving to Minneapolis um, and joining this left-wing, well, supposedly left-wing group. It really wasn't. We didn't do anything regarding social justice during my years there. Mostly I just worked like a dog um, in their various businesses and so forth. And um, it was run by a single person who, I mean, the lead, there was a single leader who I never met, by the way. And there were a lot of really good people in it, but it was a cult, you know, and I was highly controlled in all, you know, very intimate details of life and all areas of life. And I was pretty unhappy most of the time um, and bored. I often try to mention that, you know, cults are really dull. You know, they are tedious, yeah. <laughs> you're doing the same thing over and over again. You have limited scope. You have the same language, the same people. Anyway, um, I eventually managed to get out with two other people and with two small children. And that is a whole story. It was not easy and it was scary, really scary. Um, but I got out and being the kind of person I am, I wanted to understand why I had subjected myself, which is not really the right phrasing, but nonetheless, um, 
you know, I, I just don't, didn't fit my history or my personality. You know, I'm kind of a feisty person and I just don't like to be told what to do. And I've always been like that. And I'm a thinker. I always like to think and sort out things. And somehow my thinking had been disabled for those years. And so I really came out with this, a lot of feelings, a lot of very intense feelings, but part of it was how did this happen to me? And I had a real drive to understand that, which maybe you did too. I mean, maybe that's why we're sitting over Zoom with each other talking about this, because some of us do come out with that. You know, we have this urge really to understand um, and then luckily, and again, this was somewhat accidental, and a lot of people don't have this luck when they get out, I rather quickly was able to access some of the cult literature, in particular Robert J. Lifton's work, and also um, Steve Hassan's first book, Combating Cult Mind Control, just because I saw a little tiny ad in the Minneapolis newspaper back before the internet and phoned the number and got this information. So I got that rather quickly. And that opened up a world of literature to me. It um, interestingly put me in touch with Yanya Lalich, funnily enough, through a footnote in Steve's book <laughs> about political cults. And we've been colleagues, well, I'm colleagues with both of them, but I've worked with Yanya over the years on different things. Um, you know, and as you probably know, for many people, it can take decades before they run into some of this really helpful information by which to understand one's experience. But I started running into it really just about three months after I left. So I just read everything voraciously. Um, I had never been to university. I was sort of a self-taught person left high school at 15. Um, but yeah, I just started reading voraciously and became quite soon somewhat active in, or at least aware of what was then the Cult Awareness Network, which again, some listeners may know, um, later got taken over by Scientology, which is... I did hear something about that, yeah. yeah. It's totally corrupt and weird. So, But it used to be a good organization that did cult awareness. And I was also involved early on with the American Family Foundation, which then became the International Cultic Studies Association. So quite early, I sort of got into those channels. Um, I, I'm not quite sure how far to go with this, but... Um, I, I, I guess it's one thing to have an interest in, you know, what what happened to you and how you wound up in in such a bizarre situation you know as you mentioned cults aren't exciting they're really really boring and and for them to have you under their thrall even though you know you might be you know a strong intelligent woman like like you are um it's one thing to understand or, or be interested in that but it's another thing entirely to devoting your career to it and you know studying for you know college degrees and that kind of thing that that's it that's an immense amount of time to commit so how did that all come about well um i think for the activism came along with it right so um and i think that's because of my background as kind of caring about social justice and this was clearly a social justice issue <laughs> you know, people are being oppressed in these groups. Um, so I think that was an element. And then I, I just think I have, a, you know, I have a lot of intellectual curiosity. And I was lucky because there were some resources in Minneapolis. There was a really nice support group. And then <laughs> I, I often tell the story, but I think my I started making friends who weren't in the cult after I got out. And I would just talk about this stuff all the time because it is also fascinating. And I think they just got bored of me, a couple of them, and they kind of just started berating me about going to university and studying this. And I was like, no, no, I hate university. You know, uh, I don't want to go. And then finally, one of my friends, who was a Polish woman and who had some experience of totalitarianism from, yeah, 
actually brought me a university catalog and had circled a class. And I, again, poo-pooed it because I can be an obstinate so-and-so, you know. And it sat on my counter for ages, and I kind of finally looked at it, and it was it was called um, Cults and Totalitarianism, which I then have stolen since for many of my, my courses and my writing. And I went and took this, co- <clears throat> this course, at, which was kind of open access, and I wasn't super impressed, but it introduced me to the work of Hannah Arendt. And at the last class with this old doddery kind of guy, someone was, um, one of the young men in the class was saying, because we'd studied a bit the Holocaust, was saying, well, how do we really know the Holocaust happened? You know, where, where's the evidence? He was kind of going down the denial route. Mm. And this old fellow who was teaching the class rolled up his sleeve and he had a number tattooed on his arm. And that was I've got some evidence right here. Yeah. He was the evidence. And then yeah. he told us about being a 16 year old in Buchenwald. And, you know, it was a, that was a very significant moment for me, both about teaching and just, I don't know, it just was, it was really significant. And to cut a long story short again, I then went and did a master's and then after that a PhD. And I guess I carried on to the PhD because I still, excuse me, I still didn't feel I had an answer that satisfied me. So it was that that piece that kept me going. And also I I like learning. I'm, that's just my personality. Even though I didn't like to be in formal structures, I've always liked learning. Um, and then by the end of my PhD, I sort of felt like, ah, oh, I think I get, I think I get it now. And then wow. I tried to take that understanding and put it into my second book, Terror, Love, and Brainwashing. Which I again, really love. Yeah. yeah, go on. Sorry. Well, again, it's one contribution. It doesn't cover all the answers about this whole thing. It's a piece of it. You know, many other people have said lots about this. You, you won't big yourself up, Dr. Stein, but l- allow me to. It's an important piece. And, and I love the fact that your PhD was, uh, was very much about a journey. It wasn't about, I want a PhD. It wasn't about, I want letters after my name. It was about, I want the answer to this question. And, and so I, I, I love the fact that, you know, your determination to understand what happened to you uh, brought you along this this path of of learning more and enriching your mind and and putting you in a position to help others. I absolutely love that and admire that. So, thank you. Uh, perhaps we could crack on with finding out or basically um, stealing your knowledge and <laughs> making it um, accessible to my viewers or, or those, or at least whetting the appetite perhaps for um, those who might be interested in, in buying your book. So um, I thought we'd um, divide what's left of our conversation into three sections um, in terms of cult recovery. And we'll use titles and timestamps and that kind of thing so people can navigate the video easily. So the first part, how do people get involved in cults? Well, this was an interesting part of my study because, you know, there's so many stereotypes about this. And once you start looking at it, you realize there are many pathways in. There's not a single pathway. Some do go looking for something. And in a way, I was like that. You know, I went looking for a, a political group that was super committed and disciplined, you know, I got more than I bargained for, you know. Um, (laughs) So some people, you know, like they're on a spiritual journey and they go, they want to find somebody who's going to help them understand whatever it is. That's the kind of stereotype way in. And then they have bad luck to find the wrong leader or the wrong group. Of course, and really important for uh, Jehovah's Witnesses is the now much more recognized and much larger group of people who are born or raised in these groups. And that those people are now, I'm so thrilled to see uh, raising their voices about this and 
you know, such as I'm assuming you're born or raised in. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and we now have this generation subsequent to my generation and Steve Hassan and Yandia Lalich's. And that's super important. So that's another way. And other ways, you know, people can be um, kidnapped, like Patty Hearst. If people don't know that story, they can go Google it um, in the 1970s. And I talk about also people who are press ganged, such as child soldiers. You know, people have heard about maybe Boko Haram. Um, uh, and, you know, that group goes in and into villages and basically kidnaps, you know, hundreds of children. And then, you know, they get into one of these systems. Um, I'm probably missing out some. And so, well, and some people come in, yeah, by accident, they're looking for something completely different. They're not looking for a leader or a group. They may just be at work. And the workplace even may be cultic or the workplace brings in a training. You know, Scientology famously has a lot of, you know, workplace training programs or they used to. I don't know what they're doing now. And, you, you know, so there's you just can encounter them in the normal course of life, unless you're already in one because you're born or brought up in one. And that's something we need to raise awareness about, you know. I, I would probably say the majority of people uh, I encounter through my work are born in. I, I think that, especially in the information age, that's sort of the only way you can get involved. And I'm, I'm not saying it is the only way, but it's, it's by by far the majority the only way because it's a very difficult pitch to promote Jehovah's Witnesses when just a few clicks on Google and the whole thing unravels. It's much, much easier to convince people of Jehovah's Witness beliefs if you're liter literally hijacking their childhood and, and instilling these values before their critical thinking skills are developed. But I do still you know, hear from people who are recruited as adults um, and quite often they feel kind of uh, I won't say self-loathing is probably a strong a strong way of putting it but they they can't believe that they fell for it and they perhaps feel that they that they were in some way stupid for falling for it so you know is it like a choice. I've, I've heard some cult apologists say you choose this. You, you, you make an informed choice to be lied and lied to and tricked and exploited, which I think is a really kind of victim blaming approach to take. But I, I'm just interested to know this first group that you've identified who, who kind of join, we can say, as adults, you know, what, what forces are being brought to bear on them? And, and also, I just want to say, well, what, you know, it may be true that not many people, I don't know the numbers are joining Jehovah's Witnesses. We do know that there's a lot of people joining things like QAnon, right? I mean, huge numbers. Or, mm. or Trump, you know, I consider the Trump regime very cultic. And also, though the internet gives you a lot of information to counter the cult narrative, it also obviously is a way in. Yeah. As well, so it's a you know it's a complex picture, but I think what you're talking about, you know, you tried the word self-loathing. I think it's shame. Mm. You know, when I I certainly experienced a lot of shame, and most you know you hear that a lot as um, of how people feel because they feel how could I have been so stupid, and maybe about things they did in the group, they may feel shame. Um. Also, the outside world is telling you, as my mother did, I mean, I love my mum, but she's not always the most sensitive of people. You know, when I came out and told her what I'd been in, which she didn't know because it was all secret, because, you know, we were underground. Um, and she famously said to me, how could you have been so stupid? You know, thanks, mum, you know. But so, and that's, even though my mum is rather straightforward and just said it, you you get that all the time when you tell your cult story to people who haven't been through that. And they can say it in all different ways. You know, they don't all say it like that, but they may say it like, 
oh, I'm really sorry that happened. You know, of course, that wouldn't happen to me because I'm really a critical thinker. And what I try to talk about, it's not that people aren't critical thinkers. It's that their critical thinking is disabled by the process that the cult uses. Yeah, I, so, and that's the process that is important to understand. Um, trying to think back to your question. Uh, look. Yeah, so, well, this is, you're answering it. So, okay. again, there are, there are people who I encounter who say, you know, um, I feel bad, I feel shame, as you put it that I wasn't born into this. I mean, when I when I look at people like you, Lloyd, you've been born in, how how could you know any different when your children are literally, when your parents are literally telling you, you know, there's this Satan and there's Armageddon and blah, blah, blah. How are you supposed to fight back against that? When you join as an adult and, you, and you're supposed to have this kind of maturity and uh, ability to think critically, how can such far-fetched beliefs kind of um, make landfall in your mind to the point where you think, yeah, this is true, this is the truth. And I guess what I encounter a lot of the time, and I've seen this in my own family, is that cults deliberately exploit people when they're at an emotionally vulnerable stage. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting that happens in all cases, but certainly in many cases, that's the case. And interestingly, Jehovah's Witnesses even train their members to say for example um oh well you never know when someone might die so just because you're preaching now and someone's being rude and dismissive of the message doesn't mean that give it a year or so someone might not die in their family Absolutely. and they'll be more open to hearing the message the next time around which is really exploiting emotional vulnerability isn't it so well, I, it, does this sound reasonable i guess <laughs> Totally. Um, you know, it's what Margaret Singer, who wrote The Classic Cults in Our Midst with Yaniel Alich as co-author, which is a wonderful book, actually. Um, and she calls, well, we talk about situational vulnerability. So it's not that the whole person is vulnerable and seeking a cult, but they may have a situational vulnerability. Like you just said, someone might die. And so it's... Margaret Singer talks about that as a normal life blip. You know, it's the normal things that we all face periodically. So, yes, they, a person may well be emotional, emotionally vulnerable because they've just broken up with their partner or had a bereavement or moved to a new city where they don't know anyone. Um, so it's emotional vulnerability or social vulnerability is also a way to think about it. Because I think more and more it's about what happens to our social networks. And um, actually, I call them personal networks to, to differentiate from social media. But, you know, if you move to a new city, you're not so much in contact with your old friends and you may be looking for new friends. And if someone comes up to you and is super friendly, that could be great. You know, I really like this person, right? So the love bombing may work very well for somebody who's looking for some new networks to get involved with, or same if they've lost a partner or, you know, they're, so again, there are these various kind of situational vulnerabilities that indeed cults know very well how to take advantage of. And I think your example shows the, um, Again, what Margaret Singer terms the coordinated program of persuasion. This isn't random. This they know what they're doing, and you know they go after people. And if someone isn't responding because perhaps they have enough friends right then or whatever it is, they're not necessarily going to waste time on them. Hmm. Uh, I think the it's the question you're raising in the context of this conversation is really important because I think for people born or raised in cults, it can be, if their parents were the ones who joined, it can be really hard for them to understand why their parents did that. And get, especially given the suffering the children may have undergone or will have undergone. And I think I see that quite a lot, this kind of slight disconnect of people wanting to understand 
what, why their parents did such a thing. Um, mm. So I think it's a really important question to ask for to help people born and raised and their families and repairing the family if that's possible. Um, I think uh, one thing that you've raised, which I haven't really thought about before, because I, I always think in terms of like trauma, you know, if someone dies, it's especially if it's someone close to you, it's a traumatizing experience, isn't it? Especially if it's like your mother or father in my, you know, I lost my mother and I can remember feeling very traumatized by that experience. And people also say that, for example, divorce is an incredibly disorienting, traumatizing experience. Um, but something that you've mentioned, which I hadn't really thought about is, you know, the love bombing, you know, I, I'm obviously very familiar with the way Jehovah's Witnesses love bomb, but I've never really thought about of it as a, as a way that people get trapped in cults in and of itself, because it can be, I would imagine if you're struggling socially for whatever reason, it could be any number of reasons. Maybe you have moved to a different town or city. Maybe you're in a new job. It's a totally normal thing, isn't it? To want to expand your social circle. And the way it works with Jehovah's Witnesses is they say, well, anyone who's a Jehovah's Witness or who we can convince to become a Jehovah's Witness is automatically your friend. In fact, we insist. It's kind of compulsory that you make them your friend. Yeah. They call it agape uh, love based on uh, an interpretation of the Bible. So especially if you're kind of struggling to make friends, and I can imagine in and this is maybe a bit of a stretch, but I can imagine in sort of the pre-social network age when you didn't have Facebook and it was harder to kind of, now it's fairly easy to meet people online, isn't it? But in the old fashioned days, when it was the case of the telephone and writing letters and going to the pub and what have you, I'd imagine it, there were a few more obstacles in your way when it came to making friends. But again, if someone's coming to your doorstep and they seem quite nice, it's like, oh, actually, I wouldn't mind having them around again. You know, am I making sense? Yes, but I think it's important. I think that is one way. Mm. I want to go back to the idea there's many pathways. Yeah. So I'll give you an example from my PhD um, research. Is I had one young woman who was in a happy marriage with two small children, and she had just um, finished her training as a therapist. Very centered sensible person. To my knowledge, she didn't have any immediate trauma, but she needed to get to the next level of her practice and her training to have a supervisor. So, you know, which is a basically a therapist has to have their own therapist to do their therapy <laughs> with other people. Mm. And so she was looking around and she found this group, social therapy, which was the actually the cult, one of the front groups of the cult I studied uh, in her town. And it seemed really cool because it had it also dealt with kind of social justice issues as it wasn't, you know, it was people's personal problems, but also the society. And that gelled with her thinking as it would have with mine. And so she found a supervisor through that. Well, the a supervisor is quite an intimate relationship. It's a therapist kind of relationship. And it was through that that she then got hooked in. And anyone who would go to therapy to that centre, and we all go to, not we all, people go to therapy for a lot of different reasons. It's not all trauma. Mm. You know, it's just, so some people are traumatised, but not everyone. Yeah. But it's, you know, some people go to study yoga. They go to the local, oh, I want to go do yoga at the local yoga studio that happens to just be down my road. Well, if they're unlucky, it's a yoga studio that's part of a cult. If they're mm. lucky, it's just a regular yoga studio and they get strong and flexible and everything's good. <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot of yoga front groups of various cults. So... So, yeah, I just always want to be careful about sure. single causes because yeah. what's the single cause is this predatory group. That's mm. the single cause. And they can grab people in a variety of ways and different and, groups grab them in different ways. 
I appreciate you, you know, you adding layers of nuance to what I'm saying. And um, I guess this brings us to the second part of, uh, of our discussion, um, which is actually before we move to the second part, I've been to, you know, lectures on uh, cult control and, you know, events. And I've, I, I remember going to one event with, um, with Dr. Hassan and it just kind of struck me, you know, when we're talking about cult indoctrination and, and this applies really to the way cults hook you in really, uh, and maybe I'm oversimplifying again, but it kind of all boils down to deception in any number of ways. How, how are we going to deceive people? How are we going to trick people? And, you know, for example, if you go on the JW.org page right now, you'll see a bunch of headlines all designed to play on people's insecurities, play on people's fears, uh, play on current events, for example, perhaps the coronavirus pandemic, and, and, and just put their own spin on things. So it, it's kind of various shades of deception as far as I'm concerned, or is that oversimplifying? No, I think all cults engage in deception, and mm. it's kind of simple. I talk about it also as fiction. They all have a fiction because if they didn't engage in deception and if they were transparent, they would tell you mm. right up front, this is what we do and this is what we're going to do to you. You know, and I would have been told in my group right up front um, who the leader was. Uh, yeah, just, you know, mm. why they had broken up relationships, why they were going to break up one of my relationships, that I was going to be put into an arranged marriage, that I was, you know, that I would be controlled in all areas of my life. That would be the transparent way. Like, so people often say, you know, well, aren't uh, monks and nuns in a cult? Well, not necessarily. I'm sure there are monk and nun cults, but, you know, most of those, as I understand, you kind of know what you're getting into. You you have a, a period of being a novice where you kind of experience it. You know, that's, it's more, I'm not saying those are perfect organizations. I don't know enough, mm. but, but it's the, it is the deception. You know, we are going to take you to a heavenly, gorgeous, wonderful future. Or in my case, we are going to fight for a socialist, wonderful future, which by the way, we did not do. What we did do was, you know, be under the control of a, this guy. Basically, you know? and I, I'm sorry, I'm constantly trying to simplify things, but the more informed consent there is, the less underhanded it is. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And they all, they all are deceptive. And particularly, you know, Hannah Arendt talks about cults being structured like the uh, layers of an onion if you cut it in half. And on the outside, you can just be a punter, you know. Mm. You might just go to the yoga studio or, you know, pick up a leaflet or maybe give a donation a couple of times. And you're on the very outer edges. And it doesn't, in a way, matter. But the further in you get, the more controlling and the more crazy and the more fictional it all becomes. Um, so you get these layers of deception. And... The outer layers don't know what the inner layers are up to. You know, there's so you get these layers of secrecy. And I think that's pretty universal in cults. That's when the secrecy relates to deception, obviously. Um, but in our group, the secrecy was justified that um, you know, the state would come after us. We had to have security. And in other groups, it's justified, you know, you don't want to spoil it for the new people by telling them. I don't know, Jehovah's Witnesses, how they justify. Oh, they do it all the time. In fact, I'm currently um, working on a video. Uh, it's in infrared edits now with Tibor. But um, I, I'm dealing with it, uh, clear examples of manipulation in the organization's own video materials. And one video is from the 2020 all, uh, the 2020 annual meeting uh, in which they unveil a new study book for Jehovah's Witnesses to use. And when he's in the kind of preamble to why it's needed, 
He says, you know, there's all sorts of, this is a governing body member speaking. He says, there's all sorts of kind of um, problems that you need to navigate when you're studying with someone. For example, when do you bring up opposition? When do you bring up the fact that our work is being opposed? Mm. You know, do it too soon and you'll put them off. Mm. Or uh, do it too late and um and 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 that would would be less than ideal so he's he's kind of almost encouraging witnesses <laughs> to withhold the fact that they're being that they're a controversial group uh until the sunk cost fallacy kicks in and someone's invested so much time that it you know it doesn't matter so much so <laughs> it's that a lot of the religious the christian religious cults talk about give give meat before milk I mean, sorry, that's the wrong way around. <laughs> Milk before meat, right? Yes. And the Moonies do that, you know. So that's that, yeah, the same thing. It's it's manipulative. Mm. We're going to feed you what we think you need. Yeah, well, you, you, you have the milk first because you're not ready for the meat, you, yeah. which is just another version of saying you can't handle the truth. <laughs> exactly. And quite right, too, because the truth is horrendous. Um so I think deception is key. And the other key things in my kind of way of looking at this, because the way I, I've been looking at this, and I think my, in a way, particular contribution is to look at the manipulation and control of relationships. So you have, you I, all cults have to isolate people, not necessarily physically, but socially and emotionally. So you're now in the cult bubble, and that's mm. be a, that's usually a gradual process. Of course, if you're born in, you're born into the bubble, so you're already there. And then sure. they have to engulf you in their system into that bubble. So they have got, that's why all this keeping you busy all the time and basically keeping you busy all the time um, with nonsense. Um, and I one interesting thing about to me about the Jehovah's Witnesses is your time sheets that you have to say or what hours you witnessed. Because in my group, we only for a brief period, we had these time sheets we had to fill out for the whole day. You know, how, when you got up, you know, how many hours you spent eating, how many hours you were working. So we even had a little, these were color coded. We even had a special color where we had to put in when having sex, you know, <sighs> I don't think we beat the Jehovah's Witnesses on that one. They haven't, they need to up almost them. certainly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> ours didn't have the sex on it. It had placements. I think it now has videos as well. How many videos have you shown yeah. someone? Uh, but it's monthly rather than daily. Yeah. But, you know, in a way, I think <laughs> the recruitment effort, say, of the Jehovah's Witnesses, Jehovah's Witnesses is secondary. The primary reason for that is control because we're controlling your time. And if your time is controlled, you don't have time to think and to think about, I'm really not very happy here and how do I get the hell out? You know. Mm. So there's isolation, engulfment in the system by keeping you completely immersed in it. And the system is set up to appear to be the safe place. We're the only safe place. Everything out there is evil and bad. And then that leads to creating fear messages, which the JWs are masters at. Um, but, but all cults create fear messages and fear experiences, not always just messages, but, you know, some of them may do physical beating or punishments of various kinds. The whole threat of just fellowshipping and losing your family. You know, all of these things are fear uh, uh, stimuli, so mm. to speak. The and apostate bogeyman under the bed. Yeah. yeah, so when we're frightened, and this we know, we tend to seek out a safe person, a safe other. And unfortunately, the cult has set itself up as that. So there's this kind of feedback loop of they, they make themselves appear safe, even though they're not. They make you frightened. When you're trying to not be frightened, you seek out your supposed safe place, which doesn't work really because that's the one that's frightening you. So it's the same as a domestically abusive controlling relationship. 
And that's the trauma. If you want to talk about trauma, that's the traumatic relationship because you keep trying to get comfort from the dangerous, the source of danger. And what we know about trauma, so that creates this kind of ongoing trauma, not like a single moment of trauma, like you're buried in a house after an earthquake, but a lifetime of trauma. What we know about what happens with trauma is you dissociate and you can't think about what you're experiencing in that relationship. Guess why you can't think about it? Because it's too frightening, right? And I think anyone who's been in the cult can kind of relate to that. It's like, uh, you kind of, as a colleague of mine says, you sort of put things in the too difficult box. Mm. It's too difficult and too scary to think about until there's a, some way out till you have that little opening. And the deception, going back to that, and the, the fiction gives you another narrative. Well, the, the fiction that I was talking about, you know, like we're going to save the world or, you know, we're all going to heaven or whatever it is. Because you can't think about what's happening, this other narrative, the cult fiction, tells you what's happening which is actually everything's wonderful, you're not suffering, it's all going to be good in the end, or whatever the narrative is. And that, because you're not able to really think about the reality, like, you know, I'm sitting in this chair, this is a desk, I'm on Zoom, you're constantly struggling with this kind of fake news, this alternative reality that isn't really matching your experience. But everyone around you, importantly, in this bubble is saying, but yes, this is the truth. And by the way, all cults claim to have the truth. So you're not the only ones, you know. Um, <laughs> We've all got the monopoly on that. You've all got the one truth. No one else has it for each group. And that itself is dissociating because you're just confused. So it's a very interesting experience when that starts to unravel as, as you have experienced. But while it's raveled, <laughs> it's really hard. You cannot think clearly about what's happening. And, and it takes, it sometimes can take just either one other person, which is sort of what happened in my case, to validate the actual reality, to help you find a way out. So often people, I mean, this is a bit coming into the finding your way out section. I'm not sure if you're, if this is the appropriate. No, we'll uh, save it for that because I feel like we've already dovetailed a little bit between sections one and two. Because <laughs> section, well, it's all inter interlinked, isn't it? Um, so section two, let's start that. How do cults affect people? And if we can kind of narrow this down a little bit, because we've already kind of explained a little bit it kind of falls under the um, under the how do they recruit you um, section, but let's kind of narrow things down to what permanent changes might they make? Because you know, one thing, one concept I constantly run up against, and I even use this kind of terminology terminology in my own sort of shorthand is, oh, you want to get back to your authentic self. You know, there was this magical kind of authentic self before you join the cult which incidentally you can't have if you were born into it and you know what you want to do is kind of purge your being of all the cult residues kind of wash them out flush them out and get back to this kind of pure gleaming glistening um authentic self um is it that simple well, I think it's, and again, we're sort of talking recovery here now, so just. <laughs> sure. You know, for someone, as you say, it's different for people who are born and brought up in them. But we all, so someone in a cult is suffering what I think of as a chronic relational trauma or maybe you could call it in a big group, chronic organizational trauma, you know, but it's a chronic trauma. And for someone who joined, like I did as an adult, I have a pre-existing life that had different things going on, some traumatic, some not. And then I got in this group and then I got out. So I have to kind of integrate all of that. 
But for people who didn't have the prior self to, or the prior experiences, you know, they have to move forward. They have to say, oh, and I think the way to move forward for most people, but again, people, people recover and come out in different ways. But we all, so people come in in different ways, people come out and recover it in different ways. But the experience in a cult is remarkably similar for all cults, whether they're left-wing political, right-wing political, Jehovah's Witnesses, or yoga cults. They, that's what's the same. And that's that chronic relational trauma where you're, as I was saying before, you're unable to think clearly. You may be able to think clearly about other things that aren't about the cult. So, you know, I was, well, the cult had me become a computer analyst. And I could think perfectly logically and well and did well at my job, even though it wasn't a job I chose, they chose it. But I couldn't think about the cult you know, for the reasons I already talked about. So it's almost like your your mind is partitioned into things that you can have clarity of thought regarding and things that, that where you're not allowed any kind of wiggle room in terms of um, externalizing and, and kind of examining something objectively. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's how I, in fact, the scholar that I followed, John Bowlby, calls it segregated systems. And it's what, you know, Trauma, traumatized people have about a trauma. You know, the trauma sits in this um, different part of the brain. It's in the kind of midbrain, the emotional center, and it does until you recover. It's not processed and stored in the less or the sort of non-painful area in the frontal cortex. So that's where flashbacks happen and so forth. Is you're reliving it. So when you're in the cult, you're constantly experiencing things and they're sticking in this midbrain and not getting processed in a normal way because that's what trauma does it keeps you in that midbrain and that's a very difficult place because the midbrain doesn't do the logical analytical thinking it's just feeling so you know you're just kind of going oh, what do i have to do today to not be in trouble at the end of the week you know that's basically how one's living in a cult, right? Um, you know, you're trying to keep yourself from being something horrible happening, whether it's the apocalypse coming or whether it's the elders coming to tell you off or your parent telling you off for not doing whatever. You know, what all cults, even though people may have a smiley face and have moments, it's not constant. You know, we all, we're humans, we're complicated. We may have moments of happiness or you know, like I had my kids in the cult. That was, you know, they kept me happy. But the cult itself was not a happy place for me. And that unhappiness couldn't come to the front of my brain and think, I'm unhappy, I should get out of here, until various things happened that did allow me to do that. So that's really dissociation. That's, that's what dissociation looks like, is that you can't think about this traumatic thing you're experiencing but you're i'm listening feeling. to you talking and it's firing off all sorts of i'm <laughs> and then i'm now going back into jw lloyd and kind of examining jw lloyd from the perspective of what you're saying and thinking about it i can remember not really being really that interested in the future in terms of myself i was interested in the future in terms of the Jehovah's Witness future and wanting to be in the paradise and, you know, wanting to help the organization and, you know, move the organization forward. But there was no future for me. There was no future involving just me being happy. It was all about helping the organization, furthering my spiritual career, putting the kingdom first, pursuing spiritual goals. Everything is basically cult oriented is 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 that fitting in with what you're saying yes because i mean i think the way i experienced it and let's see if this matches up i'm not sure you know mm. people there's it's always good to remember the variety of human experience 
was just putting one foot in front of another. It's yeah. like, you know, I've got to do these things because that's what I've been told to do by the latest memo. And sometimes maybe I can't remember. It's been so long now, thank goodness. But, <laughs> you know, I, I think at the beginning I felt like I was the good soldier, you know, and to be a good soldier meant, you know, only having four or five hours sleep a night and then getting up and doing my tasks and being accountable and putting, and then eventually after some years of that, when I was wearing out, you know, then it was just like putting one foot in front of the other, trying to get through. So, but under that is our fear messages. I, I believe because we well because it was fearful because you'd get criticized, mm. you know, and you or you might get punished. Um, and certainly in my group, there were various kinds of punishments. I mean, people had their kids moved to live with another family. Um, early, not in my day, but in earlier times, you know, people were getting paddled with wooden uh, two by fours or something, you know and put in boxing matches together. You know, these are not benign systems that say, you know, as you might in a reasonable voluntary organization say, well, if you can make it and help us on Friday, that would be really helpful. Mm. You know? No, you know, there's a lot of pressure and, comp yeah, I'm not saying it very well, but... <clears throat> They're not oh out. definitely it's it's no it's not it's not strictly voluntary is it it's yeah you know um here's an opportunity for you to serve jehovah in the last days you know and here's an opportunity for you to advance kingdom interests that's the language that they use for me you know yeah, and some people might be pioneers and you know be more enthusiastic than others but everyone has to do something right unless you know and you can't just say, mm, not for me today, thanks. No, I don't think I'll come to the study today because I want a lion or whatever it is, you know. Well, well, you could do that. It's just that uh, you, you could, for example, do the bare minimum and not be disfellowshipped. No one's going to disfellowship you for doing, say, just one hour of preaching per month. However, you slip to the peripheries of significance in terms of socializing in other words you're sort of soft shunned you're you're viewed as as bad association as someone who's not pulling their weight and not putting kingdom interests first so and would there are consequences still, yeah yes exactly would you still have to you know go to i don't know if you call it church you know go to services or like what if you just didn't participate you know that you call yourself a jehovah's witness but you don't go to study and you don't go to the services which many do and, and some try that as a kind of as a way of getting out without the official you've been disfellowshipped or you've been disassociated they call it fading right. um but the the trouble is that i call it preemptive shunning mm -hmm. <laughs> it, that there are basically there's like a spectrum of shunning mm -hmm. so the the, the worst of the spectrum is, you know, dis formal disassociation and disfellowshipping where your even your family members are expected to not speak to you. Um, but there's kind of gradations as well where you could be not disfellowshipped, you could be a member who is quote-unquote in good standing, mm -hmm. but because you're not Towing, you're not pulling your weight, you're doing the bare minimum, you're maybe watching, you're maybe known to be watching the wrong sort of entertainment, or your dress and clothing uh, is, isn't meeting expectations, you're viewed as, quote, bad association. And so it becomes like a, a matter of conscience as to whether people would associate with you or not. And associating with you when you're considered by the majority as bad association would make someone who associates with you bad association by association, if that makes sense. So it's, again, a, a form of shunning, even if it's not official. Right. And as we now know, being shunned at whatever level, and I think it's interesting how you put that, the different gradations, mm. um, being isolated from people that you care about, 
which that is on all those different levels, actually activates the pain centers in our brains, the very same center where we feel physical pain. So it's an extremely powerful method of controlling people. I had uh, an expert on ostracism on the show and they said exactly the same thing. So, uh, yeah, it's, and, and there's an evolutionary explanation for that because if, if you're on the savannah and, and your tribe uh, ostracizes you, you're dead uh, unless, you can fi- unless you can patch things up with your tribe or find a new tribe, you are dead because, you know, you can't survive on your own. So it kind of makes sense from a, a biological point of view that it would activate the pain centers, as you put it. And actually, my work is based in evolutionary thinking as well mm. and, it's bi- and bio- biological thinking. So that when I was talking about, you know, the group sets itself up as a safe place, but it's giving you all this fear is actually the dangerous place. You know, when we experience threat, our cortisols spike. You know, just think of coronavirus in this year and a bit of spiked cortisols we've all been through. And when it spikes, we seek out that comfort, which in a healthy relationship, not a dangerous one, would provide us with what are called endogenous opioids, which are the calming, comforting chemicals in our bodies. And when we get those opioids going, our cortisols come down. The opioids go up, cortisols come down. So if you imagine someone you really care about and you feel safe with giving you a nice hug, that's bringing up your opio- your endogenous opioids in your body. And then you're kind of ready to face new, you know, the world again when you've had enough of those and you're ready to explore your world. You've had your top up. <laughs> you've had your top up and it's yeah. enough. And you don't want to stay in that hug forever because that starts mm. getting aggressive, right? You've had enough. Now you want to go out and do things. And in a normal way, you go out and do things and you may experience another too much cortisol souls for whatever reason come back for a bit more you know and it's a nice little feedback loop and that's what happens in healthy parent child relationships that's what we call secure attachment but disorganized attachment which is at the kernel of my book what i talk about is when you're trying to get that hug from the dangerous place and what cults are very clever about is they give you a little tiny bit every once in a while, just enough to keep you thinking you might get enough, but you never get enough. And because you never get enough, you're never ready to go back and explore because your cortisols are still spiked. So you, so that creates this bad feedback loop. Anyway, I have, it's kind of difficult. Well, to you're, you're basically stuck in purgatory because <laughs> you're, you're not able to kind of go out and, yeah. and wait for your next top up you're constantly yeah. in this stage of being top up <laughs> essentially yeah, so it creates yeah. you know this dependency that's mm. in your body it's not because you're a stupid or dependent person mm. but you haven't got another safe space the isolation is important because if they let you also have lots of other safe real safe spaces you wouldn't need to stay in that you could just go off over here mm. hey, this is crazy and dangerous, but I've got, you know, so-and-so over here who will give me a proper uh, hug or top up, mm. as you call it. So it's really important they isolate you from any other sense that anything else is safe. That Otherwise, it doesn't work, the system. So, you know, and, and this isolation in, in, in turn creates distrust because we're obviously talking uh, on the subtitle how do they affect people? Would it be fair to say that cults make people kind of distrustful of the outside world? Totally, yeah, yeah, absolutely they do. And even of each other, and this is something that doesn't get talked about enough, because the stere- especially, yeah, the stereotype is that, you know, well, in a cult, you're close with all these other culty people, you know, and it's all lovely. But actually, Though we may, again, we're humans and we may fought, you know, people I liked in the cult, but 
and still like, by the way, all these years later, now we're all out. Um, but it's so conditional because you can't s- express doubts. You can't say, hey, you know, Joe Blow, you know, my fellow congregant, this is all a pile of, you know, horse manure because at least in most groups, that, that's going to somehow, that's a dangerous thing to do, right? You might get end up being shunned for that or criticized or punished or whatever. So you may not share doubts in a cult. Once you do that, you're on very dangerous ground. Um, so though you may have people that you care about, in that way, you're not having an authentic, if I can use that word, relationship with people because you can't be your full self. For instance, let's take the example of someone who's gay. You know, like so I know of, you know, there are many XJWs who came out because they were, well, they came out of the XJ of the JWs because they couldn't come out in the JWs. Indeed, yeah. Because that's a dangerous thing to do. Um, it doesn't. And they couldn't share that with other people because that's dangerous. So, so your relationships are very strange in a cult. And I think that's an effect, you know, of then you have to figure out how to have a relationship where, for instance, you're allowed to have disagreements and that's okay. That's not a, you know, end of the whole thing event. That's just people can be friends and disagree. I mean, I had to learn that when I got out. It's quite difficult. And I imagine born and raised people might have that, though I don't know. That's an it. No, it's it's still a problem, I think, um, across the board, where when you have spent your entire life thinking in in a black and white way and in an us versus them right and wrong way, um, and it's either the truth or it's from Satan. And if you believe it, you'll be destroyed and you'll be deserving of destruction. It's very, very easy to, when you're outside of the group, carry on in that black and white way of thinking where if you disagree with me on this crucial point that I feel very strongly about, you need to be destroyed. You know, it's not it's not just a case of, you know, we can shake hands and agree to disagree and, okay, we know, fair enough. It's, you know, I'm going to cancel you effectively. I'm going to make sure that, you know, not just I'm not listening to you, but everyone that I know is not going to listen to you. You know, you need to be wiped out of this discussion entirely. So I think that I see that a lot among um i'm gonna say it among ex jehovah's witnesses and it is i think something that we we do have to work hard on when we get out and i think that kind of leads to the whole discussion about boundaries you know that because part of the i mean i encounter this a lot you know where some people i do disagree with so strongly that i don't want to have anything to do with them I may even speak out publicly. I won't mention any names here. Well, I might if pushed. Um, you know, in the world that we're in. That can of, be for episode two. <laughs> of cultic studies, because I think that they are deliberately against, well, I'm talking about the apologists. I, I won't mention oh, of them. Of course. I'll, I'll mention well, them. Can we say can we say Chesna? We can, and, and we yeah. can say uh, Eileen Barker and some of her people. So there's a whole cohort of folks who, though sometimes they act, and I would say pretend to care about the experience of people in cults, actually don't. They're actually deceptive, and they have another agenda, which is to stop people like myself and yourself from educating and speaking out and being active around this very, very serious issue in the world. So I have a boundary around that. You know, I didn't come to it overnight, but I thought carefully and I thought, yeah, those people I'm not going to deal with and I'm. this is what I think about them. And I'm speaking now just about the cult world, but this can apply to, you know, all kinds of things. Well, Trump, I had a boundary around Trump. 
you know, and I got into, you know, people don't like that because there's a lot of people who've been in cults who might follow me who might be okay with Trump. Not me. I am not okay with Trump. I think he's a cult leader. But so I can have that, you know, I have boundaries around that. Doesn't mean I won't ever speak to someone who supports Trump because they're not Trump. <laughs> you know, that's a different problem. But I think that's learning that, that you can have boundaries and you can, but around nuances of things, you can be more open, you know. Mm. So I haven't got a good example to hand. but you can, know. can I give you some examples? Yeah. So in my, in my own case, I will kind of, I, let's just say, I will cancel people who are racists. I will no. block out people who I know are, are are completely in opposition to basic fundamentals of human rights. Exactly. Um, when it comes to uh, other issues of lesser importance, like, for example, Brexit, mm -hmm. I personally can't stand Brexit, hate it. I think it's uh, an, a completely deleterious um, thing that's happened to the country of my birth. But I have friends who voted for it and are in favor of it. And we can have conversations, you know, and we can part company them having, and, and, and as well, I can satisfy myself that even though they hold a polar opposite position to me, their motives are pure. So I'm, I'm exiting that conversation without thinking, well, they support Brexit because they're a bad person. I can exit that conversation thinking, no, they're a good person. I just don't agree with their reasons. Yeah. So does that give you some framework for, for what you're explaining? Yeah. I think that's exactly right. And I have the same thing. I mean, two of my closest friends here in London voted for Brexit. We argued for months and then we decided to stop arguing about it. And I, they're still very close, you know. So exactly. I think that's a good example. But someone who's against fundamental human rights, you know, I'm going to have a problem with. And actually an important part of my recovery, because one of the things that happens, you're talking about the effect of a, that happens to someone who's in a cult, is you're taking hook, line and sinker, this belief system, this packaged belief system that allows no dissent. You've got to have the whole thing. And so when you get out, it's really difficult figuring out what you believe, you know, whether you're born in or not, you know, it's really hard. And it takes quite a while, I think. That's not a quick process to work out what you believe. And mm. it was very helpful to me when I discovered, which I sort of had known as a child but forgotten about, the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Because I didn't know how left I was or who I supported or was I leftist or you know, because that had been used to oppress me. So it was very, very, very confusing. And the UN Declaration of Human Rights was immensely helpful because it's like, hmm, all these people from all these different countries came up with this. And it's not the be all and end all, probably it will change or morph, but I was like, yeah, I can sign up to this. This works for me. Um, but it took a while to get there. And I now I'm much more confident in my beliefs and I still consider myself, I, the term left is a bit misused these days, but, you know, I still believe in social justice and equality and all those kind of good things. What now get called woke, but that's anyway, we won't go there. Um, <laughs> I can be in part two. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to validate for people that's a very difficult process, untangling this alternative oppressive set of beliefs that have been exploit used to exploit one and come up with your own thought out view of what's what's right or what you believe let's delve into that because that's part three um how do people not just get out of groups i mean that can be as simple as writing a letter of disassociation in the case of jehovah's witnesses but how do people recover from the cult experience? Again, I think people tackle this problem in very different ways. And I've sort of modified my views on this. I used to think, 
um, that everyone should do it the way I did it because my way was the best. Um, <laughs> I've, you know, and since, uh, you know, after these, you know, I got out 30 years ago, so I've had some time to contemplate all this. Some people seem to get out in a kind of no, don't look back way. I'm out, I'm going to move forward, get on with things. And they may also often hide their previous experience to some extent. I still personally don't think that's the ideal way to get out because I suspect those people may still have that kind of segregated piece of that. Well, I know they will still have that segregated piece of their mind with these unprocessed memories of these difficult experiences that may leak out sometimes. Do you think there's a danger of denialism sometimes when people well, do yes. that? Yes, there's definitely. On the other hand, what I see in real life is many of those people see, go on to have as good a life as you can expect. So though it may not be optimal, they manage and they can have a good life. So I'm just saying that because I don't want to be too prescriptive. On the other hand, some people just don't, you know, never talk about it out of shame. Well, probably that first set is also out of shame, to be honest. Um, some And many, many, many people just don't know what happened to them. And they just come out, you know, their heads are spinning. I know my head was spinning when I got out. And they don't, like I said at the beginning, to have access, they don't learn about what is a cult. So they just have this crazy experience in their background which may, for people born or brought up in, have ongoing trauma because they may now never see their family who may be left in the group, and that's exquisitely painful. And they just bumble along, you know, again, trying to have a good life, but there's this great well of difficulty that is likely to follow them around and be very difficult. In an ideal scenario, from my point of view, you know, people will come out, they will quickly be able to access knowledgeable resources about cults, make videos or books or a support group or conferences or whatever. As we know, there's not enough of that. You know, we, we're still a young uh, discipline and, you know, we're doing much better than we used to. But, you know, we still need a lot more resources and also people come out often with nothing. They may have no money. They may have no housing. They may have no job. They may have left their children behind in the car. You know, there's all kind of difficulties. So, but I subscribe to the Judith Herman recovery scenario. And there's a wonderful book she wrote called Trauma and Recovery that I highly recommend. She sees recovery from, and that book is about chronic trauma, as I've been talking about and relational trauma. So when one is able to get out, the first thing you need is to establish safety. So you you have to, and that includes, you know, physical safety. Um, so when I got out of my group, I thought the guy was going to come after me and kill me because he had killed somebody and it was very scary. Um, physical safety, uh, some emotional safety, if and, you know, housing, you know, you have to get the basics in place. Then she talks about the second phase of recovery being, oh, what's it called? Remembrance and mourning. So that's that phase where, when you think about, oh, my God, what happened to me? What was that about? And you, th you think about it with the frontal cortex, Right. So what you're actually doing, whether it's in therapy with someone or by talking to some, you know, another ex member or a support group or writing about it. I did a lot of that by writing my first book. You're taking all those emotion, all those experiences that only got stored in that midbrain emotion center and you're putting words to it. It's a very language based process because our frontal cortex tends to work. With, the, with language and words. And you're making sense of what happened. So instead of this just being this great clump of, 
you're converting now... it into something that you can actually use to heal. Yeah, and it becomes manageable. So we call mm. that metabolizing these unmetabolized memories. You're kind of chewing them over and they get stacked. I like to think of it as a series of bookshelves. So it's not that it's, you still know you were traumatized, but you can go, yeah, I was traumatized. That was bad. Then put the book back. You know, it's not overwhelming you all the time or at inappropriate times giving you flashbacks or you're being triggered constantly. You kind of have looked at it. And instead of, and I think a lot of that process is what I call looking at your experience through your own eyes, because the cult doesn't let you do that. It's constantly, you're having to look at your, when you're in the cult, you're having to look at your experience through the cult eyes. That's that fiction, right? So in a way, you're, te- you're deconstructing that fictional account and saying, actually, what really happened? What was really going on? What was, you know, I really was working in this stupid bloody bakery for eight hours every night after an eight hour shift as a computer analyst and getting, you know, four hours sleep. That's what was really happening. Was I helping, uh, you know, fight for social justice? Hmm, let me think back. No, I can't think of one thing, (laughs) you know. Who was benefiting from my labor? Uh, How, what was the structure of this organization? Who was sending me those memos telling me what to do? Why were they, you know, you're doing all of that. You're mate, you're looking at, you're trying to pass the actual reality of what happened. And I now, you know, I know a lot of books have been written about the JWs. And I think a big part of that has been unpicking the fiction Mm. and saying what really happened. You know, why do they really change the date (laughs) yet again of Armageddon or whatever it is, you know? But it's also looking at your own experience and saying, how was I actually feeling when I was pioneering, standing mm. and knocking on all those doors or going with my mother as a child? Actually, it was terrible. I shouldn't have been doing that. I should have been out playing. You know, how was it when I couldn't go to my friend's birthday parties? That was horrible. I felt ostracized. So you're in a way, re not reliving, but reviewing your experience with your own eyes, your own thinking, which... And maybe reconciling it with who you are now. Yeah, and I think in order to do that for a cult experience, you need a little bit of education about how cults operate because Mm. they do operate in very specific, predictable ways. And I think it's hard to do that if you don't see, yeah, if you don't understand them these global mechanisms that all cults use. One thing that I know uh, I've heard people are doing, and I can't relate to this for obvious reasons, but because, well, more than anything, I can't relate to it because when I got out, um, YouTube XJWs were still a fairly relatively uh, small or new phenomenon. Um, But I do hear from people who say, uh, Lloyd, I've binged your channel. I've I've watched all of your videos. I can't I'm I'm watching like a video a day or they say stuff like that. And I obviously can't relate to that because I'm the one who's making the videos and I, <laughs> that's not how I consume uh, my content. So, you know, is that what I often think to myself? Because again, I, I can't relate to doing that with my own videos. Um, is that healthy and is that sustainable? Will there reach a point? Let's say someone's watching the, our conversation now. And as part of one of these binges, um, does this binge need to continue or does it need to wind down? You know, how how do you how do you reach an end to your healing or is there an end? Well, I think thank you for asking that, because that brings me to the third phase of Judith Herman's recovery process. So first of all, she says that that middle phase, remembrance and mourning, because and the mourning is important because you're having the feelings, you're allowing yourself to feel what you couldn't feel in the group. And for instance, a lot of us feel that we've lost all these years. You know, we, I mean, I went to university at the age of 45, you know, and I think what else would I have done had I not been in that group? I mean, yeah, anyway. 
you know, so you have a lot of what ifs and mourning the relate. You know, there's a lot of grief. Uh, there's a lot of feelings you have to deal with. At a certain point, and so she says this remembrance and mourning phase, the second phase, is, can be quite long and people can start feeling really exhausted by it. But she says it kind of can be long because there's a lot of stuff to deal with. <laughs> so you kind of have to be patient with yourself and people can sort of give up hope like they're never going to feel better and she counsels patience. Mm. But eventually third phase comes along, which she calls reconnection. And in a way, that's going forward with life. You've put it in the bookshelves. <laughs> you know, you can bring them out when you need to. But you can think about new directions in your life. And again, it's not, you know, it's not A, B, C. You know, these things all interlink, you know. it's Sometimes it's A, B, A, B, C, B, yeah, C. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, okay. Yeah. And, but, you know, I know for me, you know, I can talk about this stuff. I can talk about my experience in the group. You know, I'm not traumatized anymore. You know, I just am not. It's what it's, as we say, it's been consigned to the past. And although I have chosen or found myself in this position where it's still what I do, but I'm not all pers in a funny way. I'm not personally bound up in it. You know, it's like okay, here I am, and this is a useful thing I can do in the world. You know, and it matches my skill set and my experiences. But you know, other former comrades of mine have gone on to do a variety of other things. You know, <clears throat> not everyone wants to teach and write about this stuff. Indeed, and in terms of uh, therapy, because one thing I I do try to do when I'm, you know, writing my book, and uh, I've written a book called How to Escape from Jehovah's Witnesses, and I devote a chapter to saying, look, you may need professional therapy, and I do hear from people who say, well, first of all, Lloyd, um, my therapist, I've I've encountered therapists who don't understand cults, don't get cults. And, you know, uh, and, and that's, pre that's presenting me with problems. And second of all, uh, therapy is expensive and I can't afford it. Um, what would you say to, to that? These are very real and very serious problems. I mean, they are, you know, I, the only reason I do counselling with people, I am not a trained counsellor and I always tell people that I'm certainly not a therapist, is because there are so few people therapists who understand cults they just don't get it because they're not trained in it and again that's because our field is young and it's also i think some of those the apologists have something to answer for because they've held back scholarship and understanding in this field so it's very difficult to find a therapist who understands cults and if you do, it can be expensive. So I totally validate those experiences. Support groups can, which there are also few of, but there are some and, you know, are helpful. And on that note, I want to talk about what I think are two different kinds of support groups that are helpful. And I know there's probably quite a lot of XJW support, at least networks. That's very helpful for understanding your group and your particular uh, example of cultic control. But a group that has people from different kinds of cults, such as the one I work with with Family Survival Trust, gives, a really, uh, gives another dimension that's also important, which is you see how across these different cults the same things are operating. And it's kind of... That's important because otherwise you can get lost in like theological arguments about your group, for instance. You know, they just weren't the right kind of whatever, you know, Christianity or whatever. If you just or, tweak it a little bit, it will be the truth. Yeah. yeah or <laughs> just this leadership group wasn't right. or And that doesn't help. So you, I think both kinds of group, if one is lucky enough to access it, even if it's an informal group, is really, really helpful. Um, but, you know, we have a very real problem in the field. We need more experts. We need more therapists with training. Uh, we need, 
frankly, we yeah you know, we need to teach this stuff in schools. You know, there's a load of stuff we need. I just want to go back to your comment earlier about integrating. You know, for people who are born or brought up in these groups, and how what you do with that self, that cult self. Yes, the authentic self. Yeah, which uh, supposed, which I'm not sure there is such a thing, at least in the context of people who were born in, you know. Yeah, and I think we need, first of all, we need a lot more research and a lot, lot more clever thinking on that. So, and that group of people are the ones who are going to have to do that research and clever thinking because they understand it. Um, but I think there are some things we can find useful. I think the work on temperament is useful and people can Google, oh, I can't remember. Is it Kagan? I think he just died, the guy who did this work. But we are, that was really helpful to me. So there's good scholarship on when babies are born, they have a physical body and that comes with a temperament that is the is nature, not nurture, so to speak. So I was born an introvert, little shy baby who didn't like too much stimulus. I'm still like that. I may not appear like that on this video, but I am, you know, a little goes a long way and then I have to go under the duvet for a bit, you know. So now we know what you'll be doing immediately after this. So. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Actually, I was under the duvet having a pre-nap. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you know, so... There are nine traits. I can't remember them all, but, you know, how much stimulus a person likes. You know, my, my son loves a load of stimulus. He, he can't get enough. He needs it. It's just his biology is wired that way. Um, anyway, there's various ones. So I think especially for people who are born and brought up, that can be a helpful starting place. My body is just like this. This is just how I am. This is my chemistry. Yeah. My chemistry. Mm. And... So that's one thing. And then I think you can think about what things do you like? I mean, a very simple thing is just what do I, historically in my life, what have I liked and what have I not liked? And I did this exercise when I got out of um, my group. I wrote down everything I'd ever done, groups I'd belonged to, I don't know, jobs I'd done, volunteer, you know, everything. I, and kind of said, well, this I really didn't like, but this I liked. And through that, it became clear that what I really like is to write and I like teaching. And that's kind of me. And I didn't get to do that in the cult, by the way, either of those things, no writing for 10 years, certainly no teaching. But before the cult and after, those are the things I gravitated to. It's my personality. So I think people born in can do that exercise as well. You know, I think that's even, yeah. Mm. Um, and then the other thing that my lot, when we got out of our cult, cult did, was what I call toe dipping, which is you come out, you don't know what you like to do or what you're good at. Well, dip your toe, or it's like Goldilocks, try this porridge and that porridge and this porridge. And be okay with stopping eating the porridge if you, it's not working for you. So like when I got out, I took a bunch of classes and joined a bunch of groups and I gave myself permission to leave at any time if it wasn't working for me. I still give myself that permission, by the way. If I'm not liking something, I'm okay with walking out in the middle, even though I'm an introvert and I don't like to draw attention to myself. Not long ago, I walked out in the middle of a yoga class because the guy was weird and he was doing some power things. It's like, I'm not sitting around for this. But more to the point is trying different things and seeing how you feel. Yes, I like this book club. You know, yes, I like this karate class. No, I don't like whatever it is, you know. And let yourself experiment. Be a sort of scientist of yourself, <laughs> you know, and make observations. And I think that's – and then – just the last thing on that is you kind of do have to integrate the fact that you are someone who grew up in a cult. That is who you are. But, you know, people of all stripes have to do that. A refugee has to do that. You know, a person who was 
sexually abused as a child has to, you know, you have to integrate it. You may not want to advertise it all the time to everybody, but that was your experience. The, the, the way I like to think of it is that I wouldn't be, I literally would not be the same person that I am if I hadn't had this negative experience. So if there were, were a version of me that had never been raised as Jehovah's Witness, that would not be me, even if it was the same DNA and everything, the same hair, the same eyes and everything. I, I literally need to have had those experiences and had those memories uh, in order for me to be the personality that I am now, you know. And and it is who you are, like it mm. or not. So you have to f come to terms with it because though we encourage more, Morning and remembrance, regret doesn't get us very far. <laughs> the what if I had, you know, it just, I mean, I did plenty of that, but it doesn't get you very far mm. because here you are, you kind of have to deal with that and yeah. then have the future be the more under your control in the ways you want. So, and, you know, and socially that's difficult because our society doesn't make it easy on ex-cult members in all kinds of ways. Even second-generation, multi-generation face a stigma. I mean, I understand why people who like myself who join have stigma because people say, why were you so stupid? But I, I've heard from many people born and raised that they get that same message often. Now, that's not our problem. That's society's problem. You know, so we have to not internalize that. That's because society doesn't, the public doesn't understand this well enough. Well, maybe that would be a good point to end on because I feel as though we've we've done justice to those three questions. And maybe kind of in summing up, we can we can take a look at society. I mean, you you've referenced the fact that this is a in in many ways a fledgling movement, the anti-cult movement, at least in terms of trying to um, apply academic scrutiny to the process of being in cults. And I, in my short period of time, I say short, I've been, I'm coming up to my 10th year of activism now, but I've certainly seen um, how underdeveloped this field of study is and how little knowledge there is and how little acceptance there is in the broader world. And one example is I had a, a voicemail recently from one of my viewers who is studying sociology and they got pushback from their professors for using the word brainwashing. Oh yeah. And okay. even when they kind of said, okay, not brainwashing, mind control, what have you, it was like, no, there's no such thing. Uh, people get involved in groups because they choose those groups. So there seems to be, correct me if I'm wrong. This is the way I look at things. I feel as though even if brainwashing is maybe a clumsy word, uh, Stephen Hassan thinks it, it's a it's a sloppy word to use. Was the word was how he put it? Um, let's say mind control. I think that there is a societal aversion to the concept of human beings being controllable because of a deference to religious thinking, which says we're more than just creatures were more than just animals we're elevated beings that can't simply be kind of wiped and then rewritten like a computer hard drive we're, we've got to be more sophisticated and, and more elevated than that and i can't help but wonder whether it's that sort of again religious thinking that is holding back this particular field which is saying no humans can be can literally have their decision making overwritten overridden by an external influence. I haven't really thought about it in that way. Is it religious? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm I mean, happy to I, be corrected. That's just no, kind no, of I what I've settled know. on. I, yeah. I, I haven't thought about it in those terms. I mean, I, I guess what I do know is that, you know, the key part of the scholarship happened after the Holocaust. You know, that this was the event that, I mean, there had been some scholarship prior to that, but I think to me, not the really central work. Mm. 
And it was after the Holocaust where mostly German Jewish refugees or other Jewish refugees from the Holocaust, not only, asked the question, how could this, how could our neighbors have done this to us? Yeah. You know, so again, it was that question. And the classic social psychological studies came from that because they were seeing, so I'm not really, I don't, responding quite to your thesis of I'm just going more to what did happen to make the scholarship start looking at this because this was obviously you know one of the most important human events that had happened and it was really important to understand it and and that's when we got the classic things like the Milgram obedience experiments and various others um because it became obvious that good people did a variety of really, really terrible things and at best ignored them or, yeah, ignored them or acted as if they were unaware of them. Um, and there was a period where that scholarship was out there and then it kind of turned into more, so they started understanding social influence, right? You know, how to group think and all of that stuff. And then, in my understanding, part of that turn to social psychology being used more for things like advertising, like how do we get people to buy, you know, cigarettes or whatever. I, yeah, I don't really have an answer for this. I think mm. there's a lot of complicated forces at work. I just love to know that. what's holding it all back because it's incredibly frustrating. One of the most frustrating things for me when you – do exit a cult is that you 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 kind of bewildered emerge from the forest and and think okay now society is going to embrace me and society is gonna uh, I'm I can join society's struggle against all this you know I can bring to the table my experience uh, and I can help fix this and then you realize that actually society doesn't give a crap and and cults are actually painfully misunderstood and and there just isn't enough knowledge in society for society to be doing anything about it and from my kind of atheist perspective i can see many areas in which there is deference to religion in for example british society i mean there's a bench in the house of lords that's for bishops you know religion really has its is has, has a strong influence in in the British establishment. And I can't help but wonder whether that has something to do with it. Just this idea of, I know, you know, of course everyone has full agency over, over their choices. Of course, you know, there aren't groups that are hijacking people's thinking. We're all humans. Humans are children of God made in God's image. How could a human be controlled like a robot? And I can't help but wonder whether that's fundamentally the problem. Again, I'm going to say maybe I don't know because I haven't looked mm. at it in that. But I'm so I'm not negating that. I'm just saying some other things. Sure. So like that. Um, and oh, and I, and certainly religion is is part of it. But I just and I'm an atheist too. You know, I always joke mm. I'm a fourth generation atheist, which I am. <laughs> but on the other hand, I think there are some benign religions and on some. Or not religions, but some religious institutions that are benign. Yeah. Benign, you know, and as they say, some of my best friends might believe in things that I don't believe in. Yeah. And that's okay with me, you know. Um, but you know, knowledge and the development of society is a awkward and difficult process, right? Mm. And one book I would recommend is by Doris Lessing. It's a very thin, short book um, called Prisons We Choose to Live Inside. I don't actually like the title for obvious reasons, but um, but she talk, in there talks about how governments, so now I'm talking political institutions, don't want us to learn this stuff. She, mm. In this book, she talks very cleverly about all of the things we're talking about. She has a good understanding of cults, actually. I think she was in a couple herself. So she knows of what she speaks. Um, but she says, governments, why don't governments teach this in school? Which is, of course, always my 
desire is that we teach this in schools and universities. And she said, well, they don't want to because then people will think critically about their governments and overthrow them, you know. So we look at Boris Johnson, who's like a mini Trump, and I'm apologies to your viewers who support Boris Johnson, but, you know, he's engages in as much deception as Donald Trump does. And, you know, it takes, so if you teach people to pay attention to that and you teach them at a young age or any age for that matter, you're undercutting a lot of how a lot of governments operate. So that's yeah. her, he has a more political view of that process. It's not probably in the interests of politicians for there to be critical thinking studies in high school. Right. And going back to the apologists, we know that the apologists have had many sources of funding from some of the big cults. So it's, and religions and so forth. So it's, you know, I always think in terms of who's who's got the power, you know, follow the money, whose interests are being served. And then just in terms of the knowledge base, knowledge takes a long time to grow. You know, so if you look at um, coronavirus, I mean, I don't know how closely people are following the whole thing about aerosols versus droplets, you know, but there's been this whole debate about how is it spreading. And it's a kind of new thing in respiratory illness to say it spreads by aerosols, which are fine particles, not these heavy droplets. And that's why we have to wear masks and so on and so forth and have ventilation. So that's taken a while. That didn't just happen. Coronavirus kind of triggered this new understanding of that knowledge. But there's been debate about that for a long time prior. And again, we're a young field. And I feel certain we are going to advance because we are describing reality. We're not making this shit up. Excuse my mm. friend. No, it's you know, true. We are describing a verifiable, testable reality. And the fiction people aren't. You know, the apologists are up here. You know, what they're saying just doesn't fit reality. Hmm. So, you know, I just think it it's hard to get knowledge to move down the chain. And I think each one of us who's working in this field is helping that. You know, when I came out, there was Margaret Singer's book and Steve's book and Lifton's work, and there wasn't a whole lot else. And the original classic social psychologist. You know, now we have a load more, still need a lot. And we have, it's also only been in the last maybe 10 years that we have all this media about and all these people telling their stories and all these memoirs coming out. You know, this is fairly new. So I sort of am optimistic that if, it, if we carry on and we keep encouraging people to be involved, to tell their stories, to study this, to fight back with their professors who won't let them use the appropriate language, um, because the professors don't know. You know, they're not experts in this field. When I did my PhD, my advisors were wonderful, mostly because they trusted me and they knew that I that I was going to, in a way, teach them as much as they were going to teach me. So if you Which is a wonderful a attitude to have, yeah. 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 So, you know, if you've got a professor who won't do that, try and find another one. But, you know, we have to understand we are pioneers in, not, in the non-JW <laughs> sense of the word. You know, we're the ones breaking ground. And we just have to keep keep at it. But we are reality. I do think ends up trumping. And now we can't even use that word because it's triggering. <laughs> <laughs> it has multiple meanings. That's the problem. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I understand what you mean. Even if we... the example you used of Steve and I, we have a little. I wouldn't even call it disagreement. We use different words. I use the word mm. brainwash use the words mind control what i know is we're both describing the same thing and we yeah. would both know that each of us are describing the same thing we have like you said a little nuance about the vocabulary but we're describing the same phenomena 
And he's doing some different aspects of it, as Yanya Lalich is doing some other aspects and other people are doing other aspects. But we're all seeing the same elephant. We're just used, yeah. From Whereas different perspectives. The apologists don't yeah. admit there's an elephant there at all. Yeah. But it's, it's crushing millions of people, this elephant. So, you know, it is there. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, listen, uh, Dr. Stein, this has been an illuminating conversation. I feel I've learned a lot and it's been very, it's been very validating for me to hear many things that I sort of knew intuitively, but it's nice to hear, you know, you describe them so uh, in such a detailed and eloquent, eloquent way. And I can only imagine that if I feel that way, the viewers will feel that way too. So thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Well, thank you for the opportunity and good luck with your work. Thank you. So viewers, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. I certainly have. Don't forget that for more such videos, all you need to do is subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel, but that's all I have time for. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Take care.